Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and my goal is to help members of the military community thrive in their post-service career and life. Today is episode number 457, founding Sport Clips Haircut and building 1,700 franchises with Gordon Logan. If you're overly concerned about this work balance, uh, you shouldn't be an entrepreneur. Because when, when you have to put in 16 hour days, you have to put in 16 hour days. Uh, if you want to do a nine to five job, do not be an entrepreneur. That's not the mindset. I mean, you have to have the mindset of failure is not an option and you do whatever it takes to make it work. Well, today is episode number four in a five-episode series all about franchises. If you haven't listened to the previous episodes, I recommend checking those out. It'll give you a lot more context about why I'm doing this deep dive and just franchises in general. Um, Today's an incredible episode. It's one of the highlights that I've done in the last 400 plus episodes. Um, If you are like me, uh, I can throw a stone from my house at two or three different sport clips haircuts. I didn't realize it at the time, but the founder is actually a military veteran. It's a pretty incredible empire that he has built. And so I wanted to give you this perspective in contrast to Marlon, who at the time was at the start of his franchise journey to someone on the other end of the extreme of someone who's just really built up franchises and even originated his own. Uh, today's episode originally aired all the way back in on January 15th of 2018. As always at beyondtheuniform.org, you'll find show notes uh, for this episode with links to everything we discuss, a text transcript, and over 456 other episodes just like this one. So with that, let's dive into my conversation with Gordon. Well, joining me today in Austin, Texas, is Gordon Logan. Gordon, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Oh, thank you, Justin. Glad to be here. Um, I wanted to give listeners a very, very abbreviated bio, but uh, Gordon is the founder and CEO at Sports, Sport Clips Haircuts, a company that he started back in 1993 and now has over 1,700 locations in the U.S. and Canada. Logan started out at MIT after which he served as an aircraft commander in the U.S. Air Force for seven years. After his military service, he worked as a financial planning and control consultant with Pricewaterhouse Cooper, uh, Pricewaterhouse and Company in Houston, Texas. He holds an MBA with honors from the Wharton School of Business. Um, so, Gordon, uh, especially for active duty listeners, I always like to learn about that first job search. And I'm curious, when you were leaving the Air Force, how did you end up at Price Waterhouse? Uh, actually, when I left the Air Force, I went back to the Wharton School. Okay. And yep. My MBA there. Okay. And, um, actually, I interviewed at Price Waterhouse when I went to Houston to Ellington Field for some uh, training, uh, upgrade training with the C-130A model. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, so even though I did interviews at the school with a lot of companies, I really wanted to come back to Texas because I was stationed here in Texas with the Air Force uh, for four years. And um, so when I was in Houston, I took advantage of that and went by and and talked with the consulting group at uh, Pricewaterhouse. And the partner in charge of that group was a World War II Navy veteran, and he and I hit it off really well. And um, I had a great four years there with Price Waterhouse. And you know, as you look back on that journey, how did that time in consulting at Price Waterhouse? How did that prepare you for what you would eventually do with Sport Clips? Well, in the consulting group we had there was a fairly small group at the time. I'm sure it's much larger now, but we only had about 10 or 12 people in our consulting group. So we became jack of all trades. Uh, we did everything from salary plans for major hospitals to, I spent a lot of time in, in uh, Brazil uh, as, with a major uh, World Bank project down there on a, as a project manager. Uh, computer, uh, cost accounting systems for a computer um, company in Florida. I did a lot of chemical plant work. Um, set up accounting systems for real estate firms. So I had an exposure to a lot of different businesses and a lot of different aspects of the business. So it was really a um, postgraduate degree mm-hmm. in businesses. And I had an opportunity to meet and interact with a lot of really sharp entrepreneurs 
uh, which was very helpful and inspirational to me. So one of the things I wanted to ask about is that I know that so many people on active duty now, they think about starting a company. And I'm curious, you know, given that your path was from the military and then to business school and then to getting, you know, four years, which is a good amount of experience in consulting, what advice do you have for them as they think of whether to go directly into starting something versus maybe getting some education or some experience or both before they strike out on their own? I think uh, education and or experience uh, are both. Uh, it, it's a good route to go. Um, in the military, it's a, a completely different environment than you have in the business world. And even though it's a tremendous um, experience, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I think it's very valuable uh, as far as leadership skills and working within a system and, and executing and being responsible for um, mission accomplishment. All those things are very helpful to people in their business careers. But there's a totally different mindset as far as <clears throat> uh, making uh, personnel decisions, uh, salary decisions, marketing decisions, finance, so forth. So I think uh, depending on their background, of course, uh, they may have had training in that before they went into the military. But uh, coming out, uh, I, I would certainly recommend um, working in an environment where you get exposed to a lot of new ideas and, and learn the business world uh, prior to going out on your own. I think that would be a wise thing to do. No, I agree. I agree. My, my path was I went Navy to business school and then started a company. And I look back now after eight years of, of running my company, it's like, wow, I, I reinvented the wheel on so many things that did not need to be reinvented. There's so many things that were new to me because I didn't have exposure to them in the military. That if I had a couple of years in another company, I would have learned and been able to apply rather than having to, to build it from the ground up. Yeah, and, and that's one thing that franchising helps uh, with. We uh, have a, I'm very active in our International Franchise Association, our VetFran program, mm -hmm. which is uh, designed to encourage veterans to get into franchising. And for two or three year period there, we had a goal of uh, bringing, um, I forget how many, 50,000 veterans into franchising. Wow. And we blew that away. It was like 200,000. Yeah. Um, but the vast majority of them went to work for a franchise company. Uh, prior to or instead of becoming a franchisee. And that is the path to becoming a franchisee in many cases. Um, so I think that uh, is, the, I think it was like 5,000 or 6,000 franchisees and 195,000 people went in uh, to work for franchises. I think that ratio is probably about right. Yep. Uh, and by working for a company, whether it be franchise or otherwise, uh, for a few years, you learn the ins and outs of the business and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And then in franchising, we feel like that's a real um, great place for, for uh, veterans to wind up because in the military, you do learn to execute a system, to work as a team. Uh, and and uh, within a franchise system, you have a structure, um, uh, procedures and a business plan that's already been developed and uh, by the franchisor. And so the focus is on execution not reinventing the wheel. So I think that's one thing that a veteran should keep in mind when they're looking for um, the, their civilian career uh, is to look at franchising as an option. I 100% I agree. It's, um, it's something where I've, I've had a couple of these interviews now around franchises because it seems like such a perfect merging. Just like you said, it's, it's, I view it almost like uh, entrepreneurship with training wheels where you get to skip over the part of creating a new product and failing and the messy one to five years that's not as much fun. And I agree. I think that most veterans would say that they spike on execution and operations and getting stuff done and breaking through walls. And so I, I love this thought of a franchise accelerates them to the point where they get the training and support that they're used to in the military and they get to be dropped into that execution phase where they're really able to excel. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's very common in franchising mm -hmm. to have uh, some of our best franchisees in, in all different systems, not just ours. Uh, some of the best franchisees are, are actually veterans. Do, do you... Uh, um, one other thing... Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry to say one other thing you asked me about uh, going back to school. Uh, I want to re remind everybody, I'll let everybody know about the program we have with the VFW, mm. uh, Sport Clips VFW Help a Hero Scholarship Program. 
So if a veteran is considering going back to um, school for whatever, uh, it could be undergraduate or it could be graduate. We have um, one of our first scholarship awardees just graduated from law school um, mm. this month. Um, and that's up to $5,000 a semester uh, wow. to help. And <clears throat> that can either supplement the GI Bill or in some cases they have used the GI Bill benefits up. So it's, it can be a big help to the veterans in getting that uh, training to make that transition from military to civilian careers. That's great. And for listeners in the show notes for the episode, I'll add links to that as well so you can learn more about right. the Health Hero Scholarship. That's really awesome. Um, you had said uh, that prior to opening a franchise, people will often work in that franchise. Do you have any advice? Is that is that something that someone does for six months or two years? Or how long would you recommend that they get that experience before be attempting to become a franchise owner? I, I think that will vary a lot because there are all kind of different franchises. Everything from we're in haircutting, uh, restaurants, uh, moving companies. I mean, there's, there's a wide range of, of uh, different types of industries that have a franchise model. So that will vary. Uh, restaurant business is, is one that's quite common where people who work in that industry, or, you know, like Burger King or McDonald's or, or whatever, eventually become a franchisee. I mean, it's a very common story in, in the fast food uh, industry where people start out as a dishwasher or <laughs> they're working behind the counter yeah. and eventually wind up to be a franchisee. And some have hundreds of franchises. So. Uh, it will vary um, depending on the capital requirements. And that's one thing that veterans, especially younger veterans coming right out of the military, um, oftentimes don't have the financial resources um, to go into business for themselves or become a franchisee. And undercapitalization is one of the largest um, reasons why new businesses fail. So they need to be careful about that. Mm. And so let's back up. So you're in Texas. You're at Price Waterhouse. What's the genesis of Sport Clips? Where does this come from? <laughs> well, one of my fraternity brothers was visiting uh, from MIT, and he asked me, he said, what is this, something you read on the back of a matchbook cover? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> very unlikely career at <laughs> the engineer. Um, but uh, I read an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, one, one morning about uh, – a new hair care franchise. And uh, another fraternity brother of mine uh, from MIT was working for a bank there in Houston at the time. And, and he and I had uh, talked about going into business together. And we looked at a lot of different businesses and, and it became obvious he wanted to be in the restaurant business and I wasn't real crazy about that idea. So we never did anything together, but that got me looking for business opportunities. So I read this article about this new hair care um, franchise and investigated it and became a franchisee. Mm -hmm. So I've been on both sides of the table as a franchisee before I became a, a franchisor. Um, so that was a lesson in itself. Um, I was successful in my salons, uh, but 12 months, 13 months after I opened my first salon, my franchisor went chapter 11. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn to become self-sufficient very quickly. And <clears throat> eventually... Uh, I was on the creditors committee going through the bankruptcy and, and was elected by the franchisees to represent them on the board of directors. So that gave me an opportunity to see it from that side as well. Now, eventually, another franchisee and I wound up buying that system, and, and that's how I became a franchisor. That was a full-service business, about 50-50, men and women. <clears throat> and uh, in the early 90s, we, we started looking at the industry in which um, niches were being uh, properly served and which were not. And it became obvious that the men and boys market was being ignored by pretty much the whole industry. Uh, many people told us that you couldn't make any money over there. It wasn't worth um, fooling with. But we saw that as an opportunity that if we created a concept that was designed for men and boys where people would feel, men and boys would feel comfortable and deliver a, a quality service at a good price. We thought there'd be an opportunity there. So we basically sold off the full service business and focused our energies on, on the sport clips. Started up a prototype store in, in Austin in June of 93. Started franchising about two and a half years later. Um, and like any new business, the first few years were a struggle. Um, it took us five years to get our first 50 locations open. Um, after that, another two years to, to get to 100. And since then, since about 2003, 
we've opened between 100 and 150 stores a year pretty consistently. Wow. <laughs> I, I love um, – I love that your advice to someone thinking of becoming a franchise owner was to work at a franchise, and that's exactly what you did. You're, you're taking your own advice. You joined this franchise. And the other aspect I love about this is I'm imagining at the time, like you're growing the, the franchise, you're doing well, and then the parent company finds, files for bankruptcy. I can imagine that's a major blow, a setback. It's this unexpected thing, very stressful, and in the long run – like it, it worked out really well for you. Had had they not gone bankrupt, who knows if you would have ever had this. So I just love this thought that sometimes these challenges and this adversity can sometimes be the best blessing in disguise if you're just open to seeing it in that way. Well, that's true. And I think that's an important thing. And I think that's one of the things that you learn in the military is that things don't always work out the way you expect them to. All plans are subject to change at, at any time. And so you adapt and you turn uh, – challenges into opportunities and that, that's a critical um, skill set to learn uh, that's very very applicable to the business world mm. um, in those early days let's say in the times when you're building from the first store in Austin to those first 50 what was your day-to-day -day life like did you have any free time <laughs> were you just always working or what was that like life like well I had two small children uh, at the time uh, so that uh, obviously takes takes time, but um, my wife was very supportive in that way. So it it was uh, sixteen hour days were not unusual, um, and um, we didn't have a lot of excess capital, um, so we didn't have the luxury of hiring a big support staff, and and we had to do um, most things ourselves. We're chief cook and bottle washer. So it, when we started out, I think I had four people in the company total. Um, from a support standpoint, and we grew that um, gradually as we could afford it. We um, uh, took it step by step and market by market. We were very cautious not to overextend ourselves. Um, we didn't expand outside of the state of Texas for six years mm -hmm. um, before we um, moved on. And um, we first started in Austin, then we went to Houston and San Antonio and Dallas. And um, then kind of a stroke of luck, I got a call from a uh, fellow in Denver uh, who was an area developer for mailboxes, et cetera, which eventually came to UPS stores. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm uh, my FedEx representatives out of Dallas, and I was telling him that I was looking for diversification, and he suggested I check in the sport clips because we had several uh, locations in Dallas at the time. And he said, I'd like for you to tell me about your area developer program. And that's I don't have one. That's <laughs> an area developer. So he told me, explained to me how the uh, MBE uh, program worked. And, and to make a long story short, he became my first area developer responsible for developing Colorado and New Mexico. Uh, and um, that became the model for our growth for the next 10 years was that we took that area developer model and were able to expand much more rapidly uh, across the country that we could have otherwise if we had not gone that route. So sometimes uh, it's, it's, it's good to be smart, but it's better to be lucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that case, that was something out of the clear book that fell into our lap that, that turned out to be uh, very instrumental in our ability to grow, uh, turn from a local to a regional to a national brand. Uh, in a relatively short period of time, mm. and I get the I get the luck involved of having that, but I also admire your openness. Where I, I imagine when this person comes, you've got so many things going on, and there's some some ability to be open to the opportunity, and also an ability to say yes. And I I imagine at the time this is outside of your comfort zone; you've never done this before. So I mm. love that you you had that luck, but you also took hold of it and and took that risk. And I'm imagining took that leap of faith to try something that worked out well. You know, Jim Collins, I love his books with Good to Great and, and Great by Choice. And um, one, of, one, of the, um, one of his more recent books, I believe it was Great by Choice, um, talked about return on luck. Mm -hmm. Everybody has luck of one kind or another. You have good luck or you have bad luck. Mm -hmm. And how you react to that has a lot to do with uh, your future success. Mm -hmm. um, if you can turn a setback into an opportunity or take advantage of, of good news like we did with the, the phone call I got from the fellow in Denver, 
that really can accelerate your growth and, and really separate you from the competition. Mm. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask about these early days is a lot of the listeners to the show, the, uh, it seems like a big concern for those on active duty is as they transition, they wonder what their work-life balance is going to look like. And I'm just wondering, you know, as you look back on those early days, these 16-hour days, what, what, would, what would you say to someone about work-life balance? Is it, is it possible to have that or is it shifting the, the, the perspective on having work-life balance in the long run? Or what advice would you have as they think of juggling their personal life versus their per- professional life? If you're overly concerned about this work um, um, balance, uh, you shouldn't be an entrepreneur <laughs> <laughs> because when when you have to put in 16 hour days you have to put in 16 hour days yeah. uh, if you want to do a nine to five job do not be an entrepreneur that's not the mindset mm-hmm. i mean you have to have the mindset of failure is not an option and you do whatever it takes to make it work and sometimes you get lucky and things go just perfect but More often than not, you'll hit setbacks, you'll hit bumps in the road, and you have to make it work. There's nobody else to do it for you. So the responsibility is on your shoulders, and sometimes you are fortunate enough to be able to take the time you want personally, and other times you don't. So it's it's not an easy thing to do. I mean, it's important, and I try to do it and make sure I spend uh, time with the family and the kids and so forth. But when I had to, I was 100% focused on making my business uh, successful. Mm. I, 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 believe, I, I imagine that that veteran mindset helps, though, if that failure is not an option. You know, these, these are people who have been in situations where it really is failure is not an option. And so taking that perspective into a startup it can be an incredible asset. Um, yeah. I agree. Yes, very much. One thing I think about, and I, I apologize, I don't know the Air Force equivalent. In the Navy, I was <laughs> uh, I was a division officer, and then the level above me were department heads. And there were some department heads that, where you could tell they were great division officers. But then when they became a department head, the game changed. It wasn't about execution. It was about delegation. And some people made the switch, and some people did not. And as I look at your career, I mean, the skill set it took to start with one franchise and grow to 10, it's got to be completely different than when you went from 100 to 1,000. How did you continue to grow and learn? Like, how did you continue to sharpen your your skill set and make sure that you grew with your organization? Well, I tried to learn from others' mistakes as well as their successes. And uh, as a franchisee and a failed franchise, I learned a lot about how not to run a franchise, um, and that was a very valuable lesson as well. Um, but I think it's important to get a, um, uh, engaged with a trade association for whatever business you're in. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a tremendous uh, amount of networking opportunities there, uh, people who have been successful that you can learn from and study. Mm-hmm. Uh, franchising is, is really, uh, you have an insight uh, in addition to that, just because every franchise has what they call a franchise disclosure document that's publicly available. And you can take that and read it. Like when we developed our area developer program, I took the MBE uh, disclosure document and looked at it and said, yeah, I, I understand how this works. And, and I copied basically um, their their model. And by being active in a trade association, like in our case, the International Franchise Association, you have the opportunity to interact with successful people and learn from their successes and from their mistakes. uh, So you can maximize on the success and try to avoid the mistakes. So always try to look at the, the entire universe, not just your industry, but other industries where you can get ideas, you can incorporate into your business and 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 make your business more successful uh i read i've read a lot i still read a lot um everything from you know marketing advertising branding um lots of great books out there about um motivation and one minute simple ones one minute manager is a very simple uh read but it still is valid today as it was 20 25 years ago when it was written Uh, and try to take those principles from every book you read and apply them. So if every book you read, you only get one good idea that you can apply to your business, or every conference you go to, you get one idea 
over time, that magnifies. That mm -hmm. um, really gives you a lot of leverage. I love that. I love that thought of um, borrowing that experience, you know, both the positive and the negative of, of just learning and constantly applying that. And you're right. I mean, if you take one thing away from a book and you are constantly reading, that adds up over time. Uh, um, no question about it. Mm -hmm. so, it's um, a lot of great books out there. Jim Collins, is, uh, um, he has several books. I think all of his books are excellent. Um, there's uh, people who have written books about branding and focus. A great book is uh, Gary um, Keller, you know, Keller Williams, mm -hmm. um, The One Thing, which is all about focus. And every day, make sure that you accomplish one thing, the one thing that's going to move you towards your goal. Um, and, and there are a number of books. Um, John, uh, uh, Al Rees has written a book called Focus. Same program, uh, same message, couched in different terms, and um, that was written 20 years ago. Mm. So, a lot of the management books, you go all the way back to Peter Drucker, mm. uh, writing books back in the 50s, the message is still pretty much the same. Uh, people are always looking for different ways to package it and present it and market it and make it more contemporary. But the basic management principles don't change over time. And one thing that everyone needs to remember is that relationships are extremely important in any business. And it's, and it's all about the people. Mm -hmm. You can be a genius at marketing or finance or whatever, but if you don't build a team and don't have the people uh, to support it and um, see the vision and believe in the vision, um, it's going to be very difficult. Mm. These are these are great book recommendations, and I agree. It's like the the timeliness doesn't really matter as much. I'm I'm a big fan of Jim Rohn and his books, and mm -hmm. uh, the the lessons he have are great. It's, it is funny though, reading it every once in a while, he'll say like, if you're listening to this audio cassette tape, and it's like the one it's the one thing that you're, like pulls you out of it. And you're like, oh, this book was written a long time ago, but everything else is really applicable and still true today. Yeah, Zig Ziglar. I love Zig. I yeah. listen to. When I had salons scattered all over Texas, I spent a lot of time in the car. Yep. And I always had my tapes there. Where it be? Uh, uh, what was he? Uh, the, the Reverend Schiller. I forget his first name. Mm. Uh, he had a lot of motivational tapes. Zig Ziglar had a motivational tapes. Um, that's important, especially when you're starting out and things are tough. Is to stay uh, energized and stay on top of your game and keep a positive attitude. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Um, and. And um, you've employed a lot of veterans as franchise owners. I'm wondering, mm -hmm. does anything stand out as, as you think of this you know, veteran who wants to, to own a franchise? Any common mistakes that they make or maybe misconceptions they have going into it? You know, I, don't, I can't think of any uh, common misconceptions they have. Uh, most of the veterans that have become franchisees have been out of the military for 10 plus years. Yep. Okay. Yep. 10, 20 years. So they have had some business experience prior to becoming a franchisee with ours. So they have already built on their military experience uh, in the business world before they moved into becoming a franchisee. Mm. What amount of capital, do, capital does someone need to think about raising? Is there like a range of capital they should think about? Because you had said that, that, that being undercapitalized is going to be one of the biggest threats to someone starting a franchise. Well, all franchises have some minimum financial requirements. Mm -hmm. And there are some, some franchises you can um, work out of your home that are relatively low-cost startups. Um, and others, like uh, McDonald's, is going to be a $2 million investment. So okay. there's a wide range. Um, it's, sometimes I see people making a mistake because when they start looking for a business or a franchise, all they look at is the low-cost startups. And sometimes, even though it's not uh, a big investment up front, the potential return may not be that great either, so they wind up buying themselves a job. Mm. So that's why sometimes it's better to go into the workforce for some period of time, not only to get business experience, but to accumulate some capital so you're uh, able to have a, uh, a wider uh, range of choices as to which business you go into. Mm. And I think one of the most important things for people to keep in mind is it's good to have options. So don't just stay focused on a narrow band here because that's all all that's available to you today. Think about what's going to 
be of five years, 10 years, and set goals and work towards those goals to, to be where you want to be longer term. That's great. That's great. I, I, I love that uh, buying yourself a job. I can imagine that some people do kind of purchases and it ends up just to be the same as if they'd worked for someone else elsewhere. And so really, really understanding that. Yeah, that's, I mean, there are some franchises and that's basically what they are. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're looking to build something larger, you need to think about how, um, whether that business or that franchise lends itself to multi-unit development. Mm. Uh, and there, there are different franchises, and some don't want multi-unit owners. They, they just want owner-operators. Mm. And others like us, um, we have um, all of our franchisees uh, sign up for a minimum of three locations. Mm. And our, our financial requirements are uh, uh, $200,000 liquid mm-hmm. and 100000 net worth. Mm-hmm. Most of our franchisees are far above that. So that's not something typically somebody in their 20s is going to be able to do unless they have a business partner or uh, someone else to help them with that. That's uh, great. But some franchises have much, much lower um, requirements. Um, but it's, it's like I said, don't look at it just today. Look at it what it's going to be in five or ten years because typically um, you should look at it as something that's going to be a longer-term program versus a short-term unless you have a plan to – do this for three years and sell it and move up and, and so forth. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to approach it, but think about at least a five, 10 year uh, time frame of where you want to be. Mm. What, what is, um, what is your day to day life look like now? We talked about in those early days, what is it like now running such a large organization? It's fun. Yeah. It's fun. I, 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 I look back on the early years and that was fun too. Um, but you know, for the first hundred stores, I was at every, uh, grand opening wow. and actually there for a couple of days prior to at least a couple of days, sometimes more doing everything, putting posters up on the wall and hanging uh, banners and, and doing whatever needs to needed to be done, stocking shelves or whatever. I mean, for a hundred, I was, I was there every one. And so was, so were all of our four <laughs> support. <laughs> Or <laughs> six, it might be. Um, today, of course, we built a much larger organization. We have about 150 people on our support team. About half are here in our headquarters here in Georgetown, Texas, which is just north of Austin. Um, and the other half are out in the field. So, um, running the franchise, a, a national, and now we're in Canada as well, um, is is about maintaining consistency is the biggest challenge. And we, in all 50 states. Uh, we're the only hair care concept in all 50 states, but that creates challenges as well, trying to make sure that the experience in, in New York is the same it is in California as it is in Texas. And that's why we have so many people out in the field. And within our organization, maintaining that consistency of message, um, making sure that um, our culture is, is passed not only from here in Georgetown, but out to the field and to the stores. So we put a lot of emphasis on um, making sure we have the right people and the right jobs, giving them support they need, and creating that environment where they can um, grow and prosper, making sure every, from, from it all starts at the store level. Because most clients of Sport Clips don't know me from Adam, mm-hmm. but they do know Mary, who's their favorite stylist at the local Sport Clips. So it's important that Mary understands um, our mission statement, our values, and lives those values and communicates them to our clients. And that's that's the challenge in any larger organization is trying to push the culture throughout the organization and maintaining consistency. Mm-hmm. So it's, um, it's a different challenge than we had 20 years ago, but it's just as exciting and just as much fun. And, and in many ways more rewarding because we're touching a lot of people's lives. Mm-hmm. Today we have about 500 franchisees wow. and quite a few of them have left their corporate job. I mean, this, they're full-time sport clips. Our largest franchisee has about 55 locations. We have a lot of franchisees that have 10 or 20 or 30 locations, and they really are living the, their dream. They've achieved financial independence, and our model is not buy yourself a job, but it's managing multiple locations. Uh, they are able to have more control over their personal life and that work life um, um, balance you were talking about. Mm-hmm. At some point, you can achieve that, and and that's a goal. You have to work towards it. 
the first five years, maybe not so much, but subsequent years, um, you, you can have a lot more control over your future. And that's what's rewarding about franchising is that we've helped a lot of our franchisees achieve financial independence and, and be able to control their lives. And we've also created career opportunities for probably 17,000 people wow. in the country hmm. that can go from being a stylist to an assistant manager to a manager to an area manager to an educator, or in some cases, franchisees. Wow. That's, that's, uh, it must be incredibly fulfilling to think of all the lives that you've changed, not just the franchise owners, but the employees. I mean, that's just nearly 20,000 people that have been employed through something that started as an idea that came out of uh, a bankruptcy. It's just, uh, <laughs> must be so amazing. And, and it's interesting because so often, I think even back at business school, it was always culture, culture, culture. And when mm -hmm. you think of trying to preserve culture across so many different states and geographic areas and different people, it becomes a completely different exercise of how do you consistently communicate this and get people to understand what that culture means. That's well, we uh, have had, a, we try to keep everything simple. Mm -hmm. And before, even before we started Sport Clips, we were using a, a videotape training program that uh, Coach Holtz, Lou Holtz, put together when he was a head coach at Notre Dame called Do Right. And it's all about how he, the values he used to bring these kids together from all over the country, from all different kind of backgrounds, mold them into national championship teams. And his basic values were so consistent with ours. We were using it in our training, and when we decided to um, start sport clips, I wrote to Coach Holtz, and he was still up at Notre Dame, and asked his permission to incorporate his materials into our training program. He very graciously gave us permission uh, to do that, <clears throat> and, it, and today we have the same uh, values that we had 25 years ago, and that we borrowed, borrowed them from Coach Holtz. And that's do the right thing, do your best, and treat people the way they want to be treated. Mm. And we communicate that to everyone who comes through our process to become a franchisee. We reinforce it constantly with our um, uh, team members. Our franchisees, and, and what the way we phrase it is, this is the way we run our business, and this is the way we will deal with you as a franchisee, the way we expect you to deal with your team members, and the way we expect them to deal with their clients. Yeah. So we try to push it down through the system. We reinforce that through our um, a lot of programs, like our Help a Hero Scholarship Program, um, that creates a culture of giving back, and that's something that uh, really helps to bring um, a disparate group of folks together when they're working towards a common cause, something bigger than just their day-to-day -day job. So this year we raised $1.25 million for the VFW uh, Sport Clips Helping Hero Scholarship Program. To date, that's over $5 million. Um, about a 1,000 scholarships have been awarded so far. Uh, we're also the um, uh, first uh, national sponsor of the St. Baldrick's uh, foundation for Childhood Cancer Research. We do um, work with the Red Cross to help them on their blood drives uh, every year. Uh, we also sponsor Ageless Aviation Dreams, which is really a cool program. Yeah. We have three uh, biplanes around the country that go to uh, all over the place, giving rides to senior veterans who are in assisted living homes. Yeah. It's German biplanes, which is... <laughs> It's just amazing. And that is a great program to see the, the, the difference it can make in, in these senior veterans' lives, some of whom World War II, Korea, and may, maybe even uh, Vietnam, um, that have really not a lot to look forward to on a day-to-day -day basis. And they get out and, and, and go flying in this open cockpit uh, aircraft, and it just makes a huge difference in their lives. And we have people from our local sport clips going out and helping with all these uh, flights. And I don't know who gets the more, most out of it. And the veterans mm -hmm. are <coughs> our people who help with that program mm -hmm. because it's such a rewarding program. So those are the type of things that we uh, do to try to, to build a culture and reinforce it throughout our whole system. That's great. I mean, I love that. Um, I love that, you know, just even the company alone you're making an incredible impact by employing people and making that difference in communities. But I love how you've built in this philanthropic area. And I love, you know, the, the scholarship through the VFW, but also this, this ability to 
give these veterans incredible experiences. It's, it's just a beautiful way of delivering even more value and having a bigger impact on the world around you. Yeah, it's, it's very rewarding. And like I say, it's, it's, we do it because it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. But it does have a halo effect. Mm -hmm. um, people appreciate the fact that we do that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, mo more importantly, from a business standpoint, it does um, help reinforce the culture in our values. That's, mm -hmm. that's extremely important. I love that. Um, one, one thing I wanted to ask about is failure. And it's something that's on my mind recently because um, on the one hand in these interviews, I know that no matter what you do, what your career path, you're going to experience setbacks. You're going to have failure. Like e even this, this whole thought of your company going bankrupt, the company you're working for going bankrupt. And so I know that failure is inevitable in whatever career someone does. And at the same time, I feel like at least my experience in the military, failure is, it, it, I mean, it's a completely different level. Failure is loss of life. It's loss of mission. It's loss of, of, of extremely high stakes. And so my experience in the military is, you have to avoid failure. And so I'm trying to reconcile for a veteran listener, you know, how, how do they build up that resilience to failure when they've been so averse to it in the military? And I'm just curious, as you look back, you know, in, in the time since starting Sport Clips, can you think of a time where there was a failure or there was a setback and kind of how you approach that and learn from it? Um, you know, it's, uh, it's inevitable. It, it, in your business career, you're going to have some setbacks. Um, <laughs> I had a pretty major one back in the 90s. I, I was so busy running the business, I wasn't paying attention, uh, as I should have been, to our uh, accounting system. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a bookkeeper that worked for me for a number of years that I trusted, and turned out she uh, had embezzled over a period of time over $100,000. Almost put us out of business. But what <laughs> it really... At that time, we actually had three different concepts. We had a full service concept, a more upscale concept uh, for the mall with, with nails and skin care and makeup, and we had sport clips. And I had to make decisions about where I, we were going to use our uh, resources we had available to us. So we sold off the other two concept and uh, two other other two concepts and focused on sport clips. Turned out to be a great choice. So from a really um, potentially devastating setback, it wound up being a positive in that we refocused our energies uh, where we felt like we could get the greatest return on sport clips, and that um, enabled us to, to grow into what we are today. Mm. So you have to be um, prepared. I mean, it's impossible to be prepared for unexpected things like that. But you have to look at, okay, this is a setback. It's done. It's water under the bridge. There's no need to cry the spilt milk. Let's, let's see how we can turn this into an advantage for ourselves. Um, we um, ha have tried different programs over the years. Uh, we, we have 55 uh, company stores that we operate. And we use those company stores to test any bright ideas that we have. Um, make sure that it's working before we roll them out to our system. And so we, we try to have small failures to avoid big failures. Um, Jim Collins in his uh, um, Great by Choice book, he uses the analogy, he said, fire bullets before you fire cannonballs. So if you have a, a program and you're testing and allocate only a very small um, portion of your resources towards that, and it doesn't work, it doesn't ruin your whole business. But if you have a program that works, then you can gradually expand it and then you can fire your cannonballs, uh, put, put your full resources behind it to make it happen. Uh, we've been experimenting with another concept the last three years, and um, it's a pretty big bullet to this day, but it's a very small percentage of our overall business. And it hasn't worked out as well as we had hoped. So uh, we have not fired our cannonballs. We're still working on developing that and seeing if there's a potential there for a completely different concept that's complementary to sport clips, but it's controlled. And so that's an important lesson is you have to survive. Um, no matter um, what else you do, measure any kind of a, a new venture or, or an addition to your business. If it fails, what impact will it have on my overall business and my ability to continue? Mm. 
And, and if you control those risks, I mean, everybody takes risks, but you have to control your risk, contain them, make sure you understand the impact it'll have on the, on the overall uh, organization if it doesn't work, and make sure that um, you, you save your resources for the efforts that are, have been tested and proven to be successful and you can really make an impact. I love that. I mean, I love so much of what you said. Going, you know, first going back to the accountant, it's it's um, you know, I, it's it's great when you tell the story now because it's it's clear this adversity led to success. But I'm just putting myself in your shoes and just thinking like it would have been very easy for me in that situation to get so bitter or feel betrayed and just kind of throw in the towel or just get sidetracked with that. And I love that it was, you know, kind of coming back and reevaluating and, and realizing that other two of these kind of skunk work projects aren't worth it and doubling down and that that leads to failure. But I love this thought that you kept on going and you didn't allow that setback to, to become a defeating blow. You, you, you focused on surviving. And I love that thought of um, these small failures to avoid the large ones and that the bullet and cannonball, because that's so great of just testing these things out and then figuring out which ones to put more resources before. I, I kind of dive into the cannonball sometimes and just go <laughs> all in on something before actually testing it out to see if it's worthwhile or if, if that's worth putting all your resources behind. It's a temptation for all of us. We think we have a bright idea and, and we can't imagine how it could possibly fail. But there are a lot of ways bright ideas can fail. So it is, it is really a critical um, uh, lesson to be learned there is, is to conserve your resources and make sure you don't overextend yourself. I love that. And then I'm, I'm thinking again for people who are listening who are still in active duty, um, I'm wondering as you look back either from your experience or other veterans you've seen, what are some of the strengths that you took from the military, but also what are some of the weaknesses or blind spots that you had to compensate for when you left the military? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, I think the strengths you take is um, you learn the importance of teamwork and, and, and importance of when you're in a leadership position, which the military typically puts very young uh, people in, in the leadership positions much sooner than you would be in civilian life. Um, and you realize the importance of other people. Uh, you're responsible for other people's success and, and lives in many cases. Um, that's, a, that's a very important lesson to learn that, is that if you don't have the right team built and uh, providing the proper leadership, it can be a, a huge um, disaster. Um, I was in... Uh, flying C-130, so we had a crew of about four or five. Um, I, I never was in a, a squadron or a wing position where I had dozens or hundreds of people. Um, but just in the teams, making sure that you took care of your people. Um, we had a number of instances around the world, because we flew all over the place, um, where, for example, we were in a base in Turkey one time. And, the officer's quarters was was nice, nice. It wasn't plush, but it was nice, air conditioned. It was hot, and I got a call from um, my flight engineer. They were in the enlisted barracks, and air conditioning was out, and we had to get up and go fly the next morning. <clears throat> so I intervened with the housing people that were running the barracks and got them moved into uh, an, an officer's quarters, uh, so they had air conditioning that could be comfortable. It, those types of things go a long way towards building loyalty and building a team. And we were together there for, um, at that point in time, we'd be together the same crew for two or three months at a time, flying in Europe and Asia. And um, we just became so tight. Uh, we knew we could depend on each other. And people would go the extra mile to help out uh, over and above what was normally expected. <clears throat> so I'm sure you see the same thing to a much higher degree when you're in a combat situation with a platoon or, or a group, a squad, uh, where you all have to rely on one another and you have different skill sets, but they all have to work together. Mm -hmm. And that, that is true in business, whether it be in the military. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think those, and, and working within a system, I mean, you have 
well, in flying air, aircraft, we had checklists and manuals and so forth, and we had to do things a certain way. And it's the same way whether you're in the Army or Navy or wherever. You, you have policies and procedures and systems have been developed over many, many years and by those who've gone before. And so that is a good thing in a way. But in business, sometimes you have to be able to break out of those standard um, ways that's always been done. I'm not encouraging my franchisees to do that, but <laughs> <laughs> but we look at different ways of doing things and try to incorporate them. Um, and that I guess that could be a disadvantage, perhaps, from the mindset if you if you stick strictly to the military uh, model. Um, sometimes you have to break the rules. Um, in fact, there there's some books written that first break all the rules. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so you have to be able to think out of the box. And I know in many cases you have to do that in the military as well, where situations change and so forth. But typically you stay within the, the parameters that have been set down and, and so forth. Um, so flexibility, um, being able to uh, take advantage of, of different opportunities in the marketplace, being aware of the competitive environment in the marketplace, um, those type of things are skill sets that come over time. And of course, the whole financial side of it is, is um, something that has to be learned by most people coming out of the military. That's great. That's great. Well, I, I always like to reserve the last question as open ended. And that is, um, you know, I've asked a lot of questions. You've given a ton of value to listeners, but I'm sure there's things I didn't ask about that you might want to talk about. And so, knowing that you've got an audience of active duty listeners, what else would you want them to know or any other final words of wisdom for them? Well, I think, uh, you know, we've touched on a lot of, a lot of t topics today, and I've pretty much ex expended all my wisdom. <laughs> But I think taking a longer range view of where you want to be and and setting not only a, a long range goal, but intermediate goals that you need to achieve to move you towards that end goal, uh, having a plan. Um, there are studies have been done, even people going through like the Harvard Business School, those people who have written plans are far more successful than those that don't. Yeah. And Making and writing something down oftentimes make, makes you think it through more carefully. So have a written plan of where you want to be uh, in, in five, ten or more years and then think about, break it down on what I need to do um, this year in order to get to where I want to be in five years and then what do I have to do this month to be where I want to be at the end of this year and what I have to do this week and today to move me towards our goal. So having a systematic way of thinking about planning your future and having milestones that you uh, have set for yourself to achieve uh, it gives you not only long-term view, but it gives you a way to measure whether you need to make course corrections because that's important too because very few plans, three-year, five-year plans ever turn out exactly like mm -hmm. you thought it was. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's important to be able to uh, monitor that and make course corrections. And that's true whether it's a financial plan or a personal career plan is to have a long-term goal, but, but adjust it as you go uh, to make sure you get to where you want to be. I love that. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to think of the quote that is, you know, in war, you know, uh, the plan is useless, but planning is essential. And this thought that, um, you know, no one can predict five years, but that exercise you're describing of writing things down and breaking it down into smaller milestones, even if your plan wildly veers off, like that process, I think, was what matters the most of actually taking the time to articulate that plan and think through that. And even if you end up going in a completely different direction, it's it's good to go through that process. And um, I love that thought, as you said, you're like building the, the, this thinking process of, of thinking in terms of what to do on a daily basis and weekly basis. I think that's really fantastic. Well, hopefully it'll be helpful to somebody. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your perspective with veterans and active duty listeners. Uh, very happy to be here. Appreciate the opportunity. Awesome. Thank you Thanks so much. Surface, surface, surface. <laughs> Beyond the Uniform is written and produced by me, Justin Asiri, with the help from our Chief of Staff, Steve Bain, our Editor, Lex Brown, and our Head of Social Media, Janelle Hanf. We are an all-volunteer organization and would greatly appreciate your help in any of the following ways. First of all, spread the word. 
Beyond the Uniform has over 380 podcast episodes and 15 on-demand webinars, all offered for free. Help us spread the word on social media, at military bases, or whatever gets this resource in front of the men and women who need it. Positive reviews on iTunes go a long way towards this as well. Second of all, sponsorship. Beyond the Uniform relies on sponsorship to keep us going. There is so much more we'd like to do, but just don't have nearly the resources to do it. If you know of a company that would advertise in any way with Beyond the Uniform, please send them our way. Third of all, donations. If you're in a financial position to donate, you can find more information on the support section of our website. At our website, beyondtheuniform.org, you'll find over 380 episodes categorized by industry, functional role, and more. You'll also find both free and for purchase resources that take a deeper dive on topics related to career growth. Thank you for your support as we aim to help members of the military and their families thrive in their post-military career in life.